Good morning. Welcome to Jerusalem to our guests. And thanks for coming for everyone. My name is Hermona Sorek, and I'm here on behalf of the organizing committee. And it is my special honor to greet you all to our Brain Centers Conference on Cellular and Molecular Neuroscience from Generation to Degeneration. We made a special effort to prepare beautiful weather for this conference. Yet we hope that nevertheless you'll choose to spend most of the time of the next two days in the lecture hall. Several thousands years ago, pilgrims from many parts of the country and overseas were marching to Jerusalem at this time of the year to celebrate Passover offer their sacrifice at the Holy Temple, which is very nearby, and meet friends and family. If you take a walk in the Machne Yehuda market, you may see people shopping in preparation for the same holiday, which will be celebrated next week. So some things remain unchanged. We are thankful for that. <laughs> but brain research keeps progressing and changes the way we perceive our nervous system activities and our lives, which is what we are going to hear about in our conference. We have a list of esteemed speakers and a most challenging program, spanning the best and the latest in all of the critical steps in brain development, functioning, and the means. And I very much look forward to these packed two days of neuroscience. And with this, I would like to present our chairperson of this morning's Hello Lecture, Mr. Sami Sagol, a dear personal friend and enthusiastic neuroscientist. Sami belongs to a select group of successful entrepreneurs who truly embrace the fact that science of today is the technology of tomorrow. Sami is a true patron of neuroscience Israel wide, and the scientific community has acknowledged his loyal patronage with several honorary PhDs. When I told Sami that Eric Kandel, who has been one of my great uh, heroes for many years, will be coming to Jerusalem, Sami kindly agreed to participate and support our conference. So we have this morning Professor Kandel and Dr. Sagol, who are both scientific reductionists. Professor Kandel is one of the foremost thinkers about reductionism in art and brain science, and Dr. Sagol is celebrated for his unique understanding of reductionism in industry and design. So without further ado, it is with great pleasure that I introduce to you Dr. Sami Sagol. Good morning. It's a great honor for me to host Professor Kandel, which I think everybody admires as one of the pioneers of, the, of neuroscience. Professor Kandel was born in Austria and emigrated to the United States and became an American neuroscientist and a university professor of biochemistry and biophysics at the College of the Physicians and Surgeons of Columbia University. He was a pioneer of molecular neuroscience as a field of research and the recipient of the 2000 Nobel Prize. in the physiology and medicine for his research on physiological basis of memory storage in neurons. Professor Kandel, who has studied psychoanalysis, wished to understand how memory works and first pursued for that purpose an animal model with large and basic neural structures. His most famous breakthrough was discovered using the sea slug Apicia californica, which has large nerve cells amenable to experimental manipulation and is a member of the simplest group of animals known to be capable of learning, at least when a real expert like Eric Kandel teaches them. Eric Kandel was <laughs> also the founding director of the Center of Neurobiology and Behavior, which became the Department of Neuroscience at Columbia University. Apart from his scientific articles, he wrote an award-winning popularized account 
of his life and research, which also served as a basis of a most successful movie. Professor Kandel is a known friend of Israel and of Israeli neuroscience research, and we <laughs> all look forward for his opening keynote Heller's lecture entitled The Biology of Memory and Age-Related Memory Loss. It's a, it's a great honor that I invite Professor Kandel to give us this lecture. Thank you. Thank you, Sammy, for those wonderful words. Um, I wish my parents were here <laughs> to hear them. My father would have been proud, and my mother would have believed every word you said. <laughs> it's an honor and a pleasure for me to be here. Um, I think you can't be a Jew in this world without being very, very proud of what Israel has accomplished uh, in the last half century. Just absolutely fantastic. Every time you come to Yerushalayim, it's like a new city, so much growth both culturally and architecturally. It's really fantastic. Uh, and I'm honored that my long-term friend, Dana Caravan, is here. He's not only one of Israel's, the world's great artists, but he's a wonderful friend. And he's been a great friend to Denise and me for 25, 30 years, <laughs> since he was a bar mitzvah boy. <clears throat> so I'd like to tell you about memory and age-related memory loss. But to begin with, I give a little bit of background. It's convenient to divide the problem of memory into two parts, the systems problem of memory, which asks where in the brain is memory stored, and the molecular problem of memory storage, which says what are the molecular mechanisms that underlie storage at each of these sites. Let me begin with the first problem. Where in the brain is memory stored? This began with the work of Wilder Penfield. Wilder Penfield was an extraordinarily good uh, neurosurgeon. It turns out he was trained at Columbia, he wanted to be chairman of the Department of, Neuro of uh, Neurosurgery at Columbia, and he was not appointed chairman. So he went to Montreal, and he set up this fantastic neurological institute, which studied, is something happening important? <laughs> um, set up this fantastic neurological institute to explore the surface of the human brain. He was interested in removing scar tissue from the surface of the brain of people who had traumatic head injuries. And he discovered that there are no pain receptors in the brain. So if you touch the brain, you can't hurt anybody. So if you infiltrate the scalp with a local anesthetic, you can open up the scalp, open up the bony structure, the skull, expose the brain, and stimulate different areas of the brain, and the patient will feel no pain whatsoever. Now, why would you want to stimulate different areas of the brain? Well, if you want to remove scar tissue from a certain area, you want to make sure that the areas surrounding it are not critical for functioning. So he stimulated <clears throat> all the areas of the brain, so to speak, and he found a set of areas that were extremely important for memory storage. And they were invariably located on the medial side of the temporal lobe. And he found that if he had scar tissue on one side in this area, in this area important for memory, and he removed it, the patient did not lose memory because he still had the other side. But it was marvelous when he stimulated these areas, people would say, I remember my first date. I remember having my first child. I remember my bar mitzvah. People would have memories coming back to them. The New York psychoanalysts took their tape record and ran to Montreal. Unconscious memory was being revealed. People were extremely excited with Penfield's work. Scoville was very much influenced by Penfield. And he had a patient come to him by the name of H.M. And he had sustained damage to both sides of the temporal lobe. When he was young, he was knocked over by a bicycle, gave him a severe concussion, and he had scars on both sides of the temporal lobe. For a while, he had seizures that were well controlled with anti-epileptic medication. But after a while, the medicine was not enough and he presented himself to Scoville for an operation. And Scoville removed parts of the temporal lobe, including the hippocampus on both sides. He cured H.M.'s epilepsy. H.M. died about three or four years ago, had practically no seizure. But as a result of this operation, he left him with the most profound memory deficit you could possibly imagine. 
he was terribly upset, Scoville. He called up Penfield, and Penfield said, this is a tragedy. But the only thing we can do is to learn from it so we don't harm patients in the future. I, you know what I would do? I would ask Brenda Milner, who's my associate, has been studying patients with me for 10 years, to come and work with you uh, in New Haven, and she will study this patient, and we'll see what we can learn from him. So Brenda Milner went, and she began to explore his memory capabilities. And she found to amazement that HM did have certain kinds of memories. For example, he remembered everything that happened before the surgery. He remembered his bar mitzvah, he remembered going to high school, he remembered this, he remembered that. Everything prior to the operation was intact. So memories that were formed before are stored elsewhere. They're not stored in the medial temporal lobe. He had perfectly good short-term memory. If you gave him a telephone number, 8845447, he could repeat it you know, for short-term. So short-term memory was perfectly good. What he lacked, and he lacked very profoundly, was to take new short-term memory and convert it into long-term memory. So one learned from this that the function of the hippocampus is to convert new short-term memory into new long-term memory. As she, Brenda Miller, continued to study him, she found that even though he could not convert short-term memory to long-term memory, there are certain motor tasks he could do perfectly well. For example, if you asked him to do a mirror drawing task, so you draw the outlines of a star, not by looking at your hand, not like looking at the pencil, not by looking at the star, but by looking Leonardo da Vinci like into the mirror. This is very hard. Most people make a lot of mistakes, and he made a lot of mistakes, but he improved the first day in 10 trials. The next day he was even better, and the third day was perfect. But if you ask them, HM, how come you're doing so much better on Wednesday than you did on Monday? They'll say, what are you talking about? I've never done this before in my life. So he would do the task perfectly well, but he was not consciously aware in memory that he had done this. So that made it clear that we have not simply one form of memory, but we have two different classes of memory called implicit and explicit. <coughs> explicit memory is what you normally think of, of memory. It's recalling your first love affair. It's recalling your, uh, f uh, you know, getting married. It's recalling your bar mitzvah, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Conscious recall of past events. But implicit memory is unconscious recall. So if you ride a bicycle, when you first learn, you tell yourself, put your left foot forward, put your right foot forward. After you've learned how to ride a bicycle, if you talk to yourself, you fall off the bicycle. So you do it automatically. Many things that require great skill and are first explicit become implicit as you master them. So implicit memory is a memory for modern perceptual skills. It involves the amygdala, the cerebellum, and the reflex pathways. And explicit memory is a memory for facts and events it involves the medial temporal lobe. But many things that are explicit become implicit with time. Let me give you an example. Clive Waring has one of the worst cases of amnesia in the world. I know it's like me dead now. Dead and the same thing. No difference between dreams and anything like that. No sense at all. The brain has been totally inactive. No dreams, no thoughts of any kind whatever. Clive was a renowned conductor living in London when he was struck down by a virus in 1985. Parts of his brain were completely destroyed, including his memory. However, his ability to play music is unaffected. Do you feel different when you play music? I've never heard a note since I've been there. I don't know what it's like to play music. Yeah, I'm conscious. You played us some music about two minutes ago. Not known to me. I've never heard of no It's just absolutely remarkable. He plays as well as he ever did. He can't learn new pieces, but the pieces he mastered, he also was an orchestral conductor. He can conduct small choral groups, but can't do anything new. But the old things he masters are remarkably well. So some of the most complicated skills that you have after a while, I'm sorry, after a while become automatic. Thank you very much. I should move closer, okay.
Can people in the back hear me? So what are the mechanisms whereby memory is stored at each of these sites? <clears throat> to begin with, even though implicit and explicit memory are very different, they share certain features in common. Both with implicit and explicit memory storage, there are stages. There's a short-term memory which lasts minutes and a long-term memory that lasts days and weeks, number one. Number two, the same method is used to convert short-term memory to long-term memory with both implicit and explicit. Do you know what the best mechanism is for converting short-term to long-term? Sir, what's the best mechanism for converting short-term to long-term? Repetition. This boy, you can leave. Have a cup of coffee, <laughs> have a glass of wine. The Ausgewoffenesgeld to stay here for the rest of the lecture. You know it all. If you repeat short-term memory, you convert it to long-term memory. Repetition converts short-term to long-term memory. And long-term memory requires the synthesis of new proteins. And you'll see in a while why local protein synthesis is necessary. <coughs> Can anybody guess at this particular point why it's necessary? The ladies in the back there, you seem so smart. <laughs> I'm sorry? Yes, but why does that require new protein synthesis? To make the synapses bigger? To grow new synapses. That's why you need new protein synthesis. Absolutely right. So to study implicit and explicit memory, people have used a number of different systems. I'm going to focus only on two. Aplysia, as you heard about, which I've used extensively for studying implicit memory storage and the mouse, which I've used for the last 30, 40 years, when it became possible to genetically modify mice, it became possible to do experiments that were very powerful in mammals as well. So in Aplysia, we studied learned fear, called sensitization, and in explicit memory, we studied memory for space. So let me begin with implicit memory in Aplysia, California. As you can tell, this is a very beautiful animal, also a very intelligent animal, exactly the sort of animal any one of you would use to study learning and memory. There are many people that feel that it's the animal rather than the investigator that should have won the Nobel Prize. <laughs> so what's the advantage of Aplysia? The, your brain and mind has 86 billion neurons. That's a lot of nerve cells, Taki, a lot of nerve cells. By contrast, a plesia only has 20,000 neurons. Moreover, these 20,000 neurons are distributed among 10 ganglia. There are 10 ganglia in the nervous system. Each ganglion has 2,000 neurons each. Moreover, a ganglion controls not one, but several different behaviors. So the number of cells committed to a single behavioral act can be quite small, 100 nerve cells or less. And finally, for reasons one doesn't understand, Aplysia has the largest nerve cells in the animal kingdom. They're a millimeter in diameter before I became presbyopic, I could see them with my naked eye. They're so large that uh, you can recognize the same cell in every animal of the species. They're not only large, they're distinctive in their location and their pigmentation. So you can give them names and return to the same cell animal after animal after animal. So this is always R2, this is L3, this is L7. Always return to the same cell. You can map precisely connections between cells that control a behavior, and invariably it's the same cell. And it's a tremendous advantage, historically, that the cells are large, because they were first worked upon in France, in Marseille, and in Paris. And as you know, the French like to take a long lunch break two hours, three hours. With the plesia, you don't have to worry. You can put electrode in a cell at 10 o'clock, you can come back at four o'clock in the afternoon, you're still in the same cell. In any other cell, you would have lost it. So this was designed for the French lifestyle. <laughs> in Yerushalayim, I'm not sure how well it would have done. Anyway, these cells are very large, they're uniquely identifiable, so you can work on neural circuit of a behavior in cellular detail. I focus in a simple animal with a simple nervous system on the simplest possible reflex it had. This is a withdrawal reflex. This is the head of the animal. This is the tail of the animal. The animal has a, ex, a, an external respiratory organ, a lung called the gill, which is outside the body, and it's covered for protection by a sheet of skin called the mantle shelf, which has the residual shell that the animal has, which ends in a fleshy spout called the siphon. 
If you now apply a weak tactile stimulus of the siphon, you get a very brisk withdrawal of the gel, just like a hand from a hot object. So you touch the, the siphon just weakly, get a very brisk withdrawal of the gel. It seeks protection underneath the mantle shelf. Now, if you scare the animal by shocking its tail, producing a form of learning called sensitization, that same tactile stimulus will now produce a much more powerful withdrawal. Now, boom. You see how much more powerful this is compared to that. <coughs> Moreover, the ability of this stimulus to produce this powerful response after a sensitizing stimulus depends on the number of sensitizing stimuli you give. If you give only one shock to the tail, you produce a short-term memory. This tactile stimulus is capable of eliciting that response for 15, 20 minutes, maybe half an hour on a good day. If you give five or more repeated stimuli, that reflex is enhanced for days and weeks. We can now work out in detail what the mechanisms underlying that is. Sensory neurons are 24 that make direct connections to motor neurons. Motor neurons make direct connections to the gills. So you've got a monosynaptic pathway. Sensory neurons pick up from the siphon skin, make direct connections to the motor neurons. Motor neurons make direct connections to the gill. If you now stimulate the tail, you activate a modulatory system, which is serotonergic, like the serotonergic neurons at the back of the brain. They act on the siphon sensory neurons, including on the presynaptic terminals. If you give a single tail shock to produce a short-term memory, you use a transient strengthening of the synaptic connections between the sensory neurons and the motor neurons. Now, this was really a very pleasing result because until this was found, no one understood what the mechanism of learning was in any situation. Now, Kahal had predicted that learning is likely to involve changes in the strength of how neurons talk to one another. But there were other people who had other ideas, and one didn't know until one could test it directly. And a pleasure provided the first test. Short-term memory involves a transient strengthening of synaptic connections. And that's because there's a chemical substance called transmitter, and more transmitters released as a result of this modulatory action than it was in the control state. Now, if you could repeat it stimuli, two things happen. One, you alter gene expression, and two, you grow new synaptic connections. Now, this really upsets some people. I've mentioned this before. This means that if you remember anything about this lecture, and I urge you to forget it, but if by chance you remember something, it's because you walk out of this lecture with a different head than you walked into this lecture with. There are new synaptic connections formed. <clears throat> Moreover, this involves gene expressions. This makes the young women in the audience extremely nervous. Why? Because gene expressionists say, my genes are gonna be altered. I'm planning to go home tonight and make love with my husband because we want to have a baby, and my genes are going to be changed. That baby has to remember the schmutz that I heard in that lecture today, <laughs> this absolute garbage. Chas <laughs> This is terrible. I assure you, this will not affect any children. You have my permission to do whatever you want tonight. This is altering gene expression in specific nerve cells of the brain. It doesn't get to the sperm, it doesn't get to the egg. Nothing to worry about, okay? You're just altering gene expression in specific nerve cells of the brain. It does not get on to subsequent generations. The growth is quite dramatic. Let me show you what it is in aplysia. Sensory neuron, motor neuron, before long-term memory, and after long-term memory, you've got a doubling of the number of synaptic connections. When you learn something, the change is not this dramatic, I should tell you. And I now can outline for you, because we've spent some time working it out, what the molecular details are. You stimulate the tail, you activate the modulatory neurons, they act on a seven transmembrane spanning receptor, which activates an adenyl cyclase, increases the level of cyclic AMP, activates the cyclic AMP-dependent protein kinase. The cyclic AMP-dependent protein kinase leads to the release of more transmitter from the presynaptic terminal, which causes a transient strengthening of synaptic strength. So this is an increase in strength because you're causing more release of chemical transmitter. With repeated stimulation, the cyclic AMP-dependent protein kinase translocates into the nucleus. 
in so doing it recruits another kinase called MAP kinase, and each does their own job. The MAP kinase removes CREP2, which is a repressor uh, of gene activation, and cyclic AMP-dependent protein kinase activates CREP, which is an activator of genes. CREP acts on downstream genes to give rise to the growth of new synaptic <coughs> connections. So if you block CREP1, you block the growth of new synaptic connections. If you overexpress CREP2, you block the growth of new synaptic connections. What about explicit memory? Memory for people, places, and objects, which involves the medial temporal lobe and the hippocampus, and this requires in people conscious attention. Now, what is commonly represented in the hippocampus, what is commonly studied, is representation of space. Many of you probably know this. And this has a fantastic story to it. Uh, if you are a cab driver in London, unlike being a cab driver in New York, if you're a cab driver in New York and you ask the cab, will you take me on Broadway from 250th Street to 240th Street, he says, no, how do I get there? In London, you have to study the streets systematically, pass rigorous examinations in order to become a taxi driver. <clears throat> and as people become taxi drivers, their hippocampus becomes larger. And every time they think of a rich route, Hyde Park to Primrose Hill, the hippocampus lights up. The longer they drive a cab, the larger the hippocampus becomes. And when they retire, the hippocampus shrinks. So what's the take home lesson from that? Don't retire. <laughs> like you and me, right? It's, we're only doing it for the hippocampus. So this is really quite remarkable, that the hippocampus really becomes larger with this, and we know the pathways that are involved, and they can be studied not only in people, they can be studied in mice. So uh, spatial stimuli activate sight, touch, smell, position, sense, depending on what kind of spatial stimuli are. They get passed onto association cortex to the entorhinal cortex, which is an input to the hippocampus, uh, and these pathways become strengthened as a result of learning in the mouse. So all of these become strengthened. And when you look at the mechanism underlying it, it turns out that the early steps, short-term memory, are quite different than you saw in a snail with sensitization. Uh, there's an NMDA receptor and there's a different second messenger. It's the uh, CAM kinase 2 that is involved. But long-term memory, surprisingly, is very similar involves a modulatory transmitter, it's not serotonin, it's dopamine, but activates the cyclic AMP-dependent protein kinase, PKA, CREP2 has to be removed, CREP1 has to be activated, and growth of new synaptic connections have to occur. And you can show that if you block one of these steps, for example, you block PKA, you dramatically interfere with spatial memory. This is a control, this is an animal in which uh, uh, the uh, RBAB48 uh, has been blocked, okay? The PK has been blocked. So despite the fact that we're looking at two very different kinds of learning processes, it's surprising that on a molecular level, they're very conserved. And this has been really one of the remarkable and revolutionary insights that has come from molecular biology. It has not only told us the mechanisms underlying, uh, you know, important, in fact, all biological processes, but it's also shown us that two apparently different kinds of biological processes have fundamental components in common. And here we say, see the same thing. The initial steps are somewhat different, but once you get to the long-term process, you activate the cyclic AMP-dependent protein kinase, you activate CREP1, you get rid of CREP2, and you go on to the growth of new <laughs> synaptic connections. Now what about the aging brain? This does not involve most of you, but some of us are aging. So what's happening in the aging brain? Uh, this is a recent phenomenon. People didn't worry about this until you know, 50 or 60 years ago. Why is that so? People didn't live long enough to have tourists with age-related memory loss. The average lifespan in 1900 is 50 years. Now, 76 for men and 81 for the stronger sex for women. It's a remarkable change and probably will, to a certain degree, continue to increase. Alzheimer's disease 
is a late onset disease. 3% of people in the 70s have it. Half the people in the 90s have it. So this was not something people worried about 50, 60 years ago, when people didn't live that long, 100 years ago. But now this has become a real epidemic. It's a genuine worry. And people are you know, looking for a number of different ways of trying to solve this problem. But as Alzheimer's disease began to appear in the scene, we also saw there's another kind of process, and one didn't quite know how it worked. One saw that there was, with almost everybody, a certain weakening of memory with age. You would forget certain names, you'd forget certain locations, and one didn't know, is this a separate process, which is like the, the cognitive parallel of aging, like your muscles get weaker, you get a little bit more stiffer, maybe your mind gets a little bit stiffer, or is it the early signs of Alzheimer's disease? So people began to explore this. Many thought it was early signs of Alzheimer's disease. Many thought it was a separate process. It's the normal or commonly normal process that accompanies aging. Uh, so my colleagues and I became interested in this question, and we wanted to know, is it early Alzheimer's, or is it a separate process? So we began to explore a number of different dimensions. Age of onset and progression, do they differ too? Anatomic localization and molecular defects. So let me begin with the beginning, age of onset and progression. I asked the question, look, let's look at a mouse. Mouse does not get Alzheimer's disease. You can put an Alzheimer's gene artificially into the mouse, it'll get Alzheimer's, but on its own, it doesn't get Alzheimer's disease. But does it lose memory with age? Take it. Take a look at it. The memory goes down with age. When it reaches middle age, 12 months, boom, a severe drop in memory. So here, mouse clearly shows it has age-related memory loss, no contamination by Alzheimer's disease. That was a very clean result. And we wanted to know, is there an anatomical <coughs> distinction between Alzheimer's disease and age-related memory loss? So Scott Small, who many of you know, is an Israeli uh, uh, birth, uh, a very good scientist with whom I've had the privilege of collaborating, but he did this uh, early on his own, in which he looked at whether or not a different region in the brain is involved in normal aging compared to Alzheimer's disease. And he found that in, in, we had known before that uh, Alzheimer's disease begins in the enteronal cortex. He found that age-related memory loss begins in the dentate gyrus. So there were separate A areas between dentate gyrus involved in aging and enteronal cortex involved in Alzheimer's disease. So that clearly indicated further evidence for the fact that these are two distinct diseases. And then we started to collaborate. We said, maybe we can get some molecular insight into this. And we used affirmatric chips and we used post-mortem brains from people who had died without having Alzheimer's disease. And we looked at the dentate gyrus of people who ranged in age from 38 to 90, and we used as a control the enteronal cortex. We wanted to see, are there any alterations in gene expression that are systematic as a function of age, and they might give us some molecular clues to age-related memory loss. With affirmatric chips, you can, you can study up to 23,000 genes. We came on 19 transcripts that varied in a systematic way, but one that was particularly dramatic and stood out was a gene called RBAB48. Uh, this was selectively affected in the dentate gyrus, not in the enteronal cortex, and not in other areas of the hippocampus. So this simply shows you dentate gyrus, messenger RNA level, for RBAB48 and the protein level for RBAB48. If you looked in the enteronal cortex, you saw nothing. No change in the RNA, no change in the protein level. What is RBAB48? It's actually very interesting. RBAB48 is part of the Krebs complex. You start off with Krebs, Krebs 1, phosphorylated by PKA. It then recruits the Krebs binding protein, CBP, and the Krebs binding protein recruits RBAB48, which is a histone acetylase, and it produces acetylation of histone 4, which causes chromatin rearrangement, which allows for activation of genes. So it's a critical step in turning on genes. So clearly, this is very important. 
critical for turning on genes. Moreover, it's part of the Krebs complex. So this is used in transition from short-term to long-term memory. So humans allow you to do correlations, but they don't allow you to experiment. So we wanted to say, can we you know, manipulate RBAB48? For that, we have to go to the mouse. So first we had to see, does RBAB48 go down as the mouse ages? So we looked as a function of age and a young mouse and an old mouse, and sure enough, in the dente gyrus, RBAB48 went down. In other regions of the hippocampus, it didn't change at all. So this was consistent with what we found in humans, but now we had it in the mouse. And now we can do some nice uh, experiments. This is a young mouse. This is an old mouse. The young mouse has a lot of RBAB48. The old mouse has very little RBAB48. Well, this just shows us what I showed you before, but now we can experiment. We can take a uh, young mouse and we can inhibit RBAB48 and we see how it affects novel ob object recognition, a task that involves the hippocampus. And we see that if we lower RBAB48, we severely impair the ability to do this task. On the other hand, if we take an old mouse and restore RBAB48, it regains the ability to do spatial tasks. So if we move this up and down, we can control the animal's behavior. This single gene is really important for age-related memory loss. So then Scott asked, well, what about <coughs> if, if we look at these old animals and they have it in, and, and I'm sorry, if we take an animal, even a young animal, and we inhibit RBAB48, will we interfere in the dentate gyrus? And with imaging experiments, this is control, RBAB48 inhibited, we can see we interfere with imaging in the dentate gyrus. So this really fits with the fact that this is an important player in age-related memory loss. So let me summarize what I've said so far. We have now really pretty good evidence that age-related memory loss and Alzheimer's disease are two different disorders. The age of onset differs. Age-related memory loss begins earlier, begins in midlife. Alzheimer's disease begins, <coughs> excuse me, in later life. It differs in anatomic localization. Age-related memory loss begins in the dentate gyrus and doesn't spread as far as we know. Alzheimer's disease begins in the enteronal cortex and spreads all over the brain. And the molecular defect is different. Humans show a linear decrease in RBAB48 messenger RNA protein. Old mice have decreased RBAB48 and young mice have reduced RBAB48. When they have a reduced RBA, it shows a memory deficit. In Alzheimer's disease, you don't find an RBAB48 abnormality, you find a beta toxicity. So clearly quite different. And more recently, we've made a very interesting set of um, discoveries, which are quite encouraging because they give you one way of overcoming age-related memory loss. Uh, and that is um, Gerard Kasenki at Columbia, the chairman of genetics, has made a very interesting discovery. He's found that bone is an endocrine organ. It releases a hormone called osteocalcin, and this has magical properties I'm gonna show you. So osteocalcin is released by bone, and it acts on many organs of the body, on muscle, on the liver, on the pancreas, on the testes, and on the brain. It gets through the blood-brain barrier, it counteracts depression and anxiety, it helps in spatial uh, learning and memory, and we wanted to know, in collaboration with him, does osteocalcin affect age-related memory loss? So we began to look at it. We found that direct administration of osteocalcin in the dente gyrus enhances contextual fear discrimination in both young and old animals. So this is the dente gyrus, control osteocalcin, the animal does better in discrimination task, and also an old animal does better in the discrimination task. CA3, which is not critical for this, is not involved. So the dente gyrus, which is critical for age-related memory loss, is selectively affected by osteocalcin. Osteocalcin will not ameliorate age-related memory loss if we knock out RBAB48. So clearly, osteocalcin is acting through this switch that is critical for long-term memory and for the persistence of normal memory with age, RBAB48. When you inject osteocalcin directly into the dentate gyrus, 
you increase the level of PKA, you increase the level of phosphocreb, and you increase RBAB48. So osteocalcin acts on all the components that are necessary for maintaining age-related memory loss, PKA, phosphocreb, and RBAB48. By contrast, knockouts of uh, osteocalcin have low amounts of phosphocreb and low amounts of RBAB48. If you inject osteocalcin into the tail vein of a rat, it gets into the brain, so it gets through the blood-brain barrier, and you can pick it up with an antibody that reacts both with the endogenous and recombinant osteocalcin. So this is controlled, this is we injected osteocalcin, and you have this specific antibody, and you see that the stuff is getting into the brain very well. Moreover, we recently, uh, by means of a very nice screen, identified what looks to be a candidate for the receptor that, uh, it, 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 that is really critical for the action of osteocalcin, the osteocalcin receptor that is critical for the action of osteocalcin. And we got this from hippocampal membranes and looked like a very good candidate. We call it GRP-158. And to test this, we knocked it out to see what would happen. And if you knock it out, you interfere with the ability of osteocalcin to enhance memory storage. So it has no effect whatsoever with the receptor locked out. So we have very good reason to believe we've not identified the correct ligand, but the correct receptor, which contributes important to age-related memory loss. So let me just end by showing you some of the consequences of osteocalcin as a function of age. Uh, aged mice show a decline in memory <coughs> performance, and for example, a novel object recognition. But if you give them osteocalcin, the performance improves. It not only improves in aged, it also improves in young. So both in young and in aged, it gets better. But as a function of age, the level of osteocalcin goes down. And that's not surprising. The bone mass goes down as you age, and as the bone mass goes down, you release less osteocalcin. So one of the lessons to learn on this is to keep the bone mass as active as possible, to exercise as much as possible. So when you exercise, osteocalcin level goes up. <laughs> this is an aged mice injected with osteocalcin, running around like mad, having a great old time in Yerushalayim. And here, these are just sleeping away, these aged mice, and they're not taking any advantage of the pleasure they could have if they had more osteocalcin. So let me summarize again. Osteocalcin released by bone ameliorates age-related memory loss through CREB1 and RBAB48. Because aging is associated with decreasing bone mass, this decrease in osteocalcin could contribute to age-related memory loss. Conversely, this might explain the beneficial effects of cognition in the aged of vigorous exercise which builds bone mass. The versatility of age-related memory loss strengthens the idea that age-related memory loss and Alzheimer's disease are distinct diseases. A sound body helps assure a sound mind. So let me summarize age-related memory loss and Alzheimer's disease. Age-related memory loss is an early onset, earlier than Alzheimer's, and progresses. Late Alzheimer's disease has usually a later onset. I should make one exception to it. The people in the audience who know medicine will realize this. There is a genetic form of Alzheimer's disease, quite rare, but it occurs, which occurs in the late 30s and early 40s. I'm not speaking about that. I'm speaking about the spontaneously occurring <laughs> Alzheimer's disease. The anatomy is different. Alzheimer's begins at enteronal cortex and spreads widely, killing many cells along the way. Age-related memory loss begins and stays in a dente gyrus, and the molecular defect in age-related memory loss is decreasing RBAB48 and cyclic gain P signaling, and no or minor cell loss, while in Alzheimer's you have A-beta uh, toxicity, protein folding disorder, major loss of nerve cells. So what's the treatment for age-related memory loss? Regular physical exercise to increase osteocalcin. Good diet, low in animal fats, control, diabetes and hypertension, absolutely essential. Cognitive challenges, learn new tasks, stay socially involved. Go to Pesach Seders, that's the perfect way for social involvement. <laughs> the key, continue to work and to learn and come to future Hella Lectures. Thank you very much. <laughs>